You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. Musician. Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 117 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, your host for the show, and today we're going to hear from Paul Anthony of Rumblefish. Rumblefish is a sync licensing company, which means their job is to work on behalf of the independent artists to get their music placed in film, TV, video games, and a whole lot more. It's been a long time since we've talked about sync licensing on the podcast, and a lot has changed in the way people are using music in new forms of media, and there's really some amazing new revenue streams opening up for the independent artists that really didn't exist a few years back, so we're going to discuss some of that today. But before we get to the interview, I think it's important that I mention that through a new partnership between CD Baby and Rumblefish, CD Baby is now offering sync licensing as a part of the service included for free with your album or song submission. So if you have music selling through CD Baby, all you need to do to make your music available for sync opportunities, which includes making money off of your music on YouTube, all you need to do is log into your account and opt in for the sync licensing service. And of course, if you're not already selling through CD Baby, you can sign up your music at members.cdbaby.com. All right, well, let's get to my interview with Paul Anthony from Rumblefish. So I'm here at the Rumblefish office with... Paul Anthony of Rumblefish. Paul, how you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah, actually, you're having me, so because I'm at your office. I am having you. <laughs> yeah, welcome to our lair. <laughs> it's a beautiful sunny day. Yes, it is. Can't I'm completely in Portland in January. Beautiful sunny day. But People uh, are calling it January. Ah, you know, this is kind of like June weather. <laughs> yeah, amazingly enough. It has been pretty nice. So yeah, yeah, lots of exciting news, um, both in CD Baby Camp and Rumblefish Camp that with our new partnership on sync licensing. And uh, so I wanted to have you on the podcast to discuss um, kind of what sync licensing is for a lot of those folks, that this is their kind of first introduction to sync licensing. And then we can kind of unpack it a little bit more with what Rumblefish specifically does and then how our artists can use this to our their advantage. So why don't you start off just telling us a little bit about Rumblefish and how you started it and how it came about. Yeah, so uh, Rumblefish has been around for quite a while now, a little over, um, in a, since its first incarnation, a little over 15 years ago, believe it or not, which feels like 150 years ago. <laughs> but, but it all started in the dorm room. I, I, I uh, have been making music ever since I was a kid and made my first album when I was like 13, playing drums and then went on to study music in college. I went to the University of Oregon in, in Eugene, Oregon, here, and uh, or just two miles south from here, I guess, close enough. And and what happened was I just fell in love with writing music for orchestra and I had to find a way to pay my bills, so I started licensing my music homework. And uh, that went pretty well, and I had an orchestra and a recording studio and a bunch of music composition and recording homework to turn in, so I figured why not license my music homework and uh, make a little bit money make a little bit of money to help pay for school and so that was like the 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 actual you know moment of conception of Rumblefish where I realized that I loved writing music, but um, that I could make money for myself as an artist by by finding other places other than just like selling CDs. Mm -hmm. And so that naturally turned into, you know, whatever I couldn't write, I'd ask my friends who were also in music to, to provide to me so I could put it in the movie or the ad or whatever project I happened to be working on. So if it was a reggae track or, you know, more disco type thing, jazz thing, stuff I just didn't know how to write or, or play, I'd uh, license it from them and split the money with them. And then, you know, next thing you know, it, it turned into, you know, several years later, probably like four or five years later, it turned into more, more licensing other people's music than my own. So from the very beginning, this was just started by, Rumblefish was really started by a musician that was trying to make money with their music, you know, which is 
probably similar to the situation where a lot of CD Baby artists that are out there is trying to find, you know, wh- what are some new ways that I can take take what I love to do and, and make some money and make some more music. So that that's how it started. For some of those folks that this kind of licensing is new to them, kind of explain sync licensing, what rights are involved, and, and how it works. Sure, yeah. So sync licensing, uh, first off, the word sync. The word sync is an abbreviation, or it's a short for synchronization. And synchronization is what you think, um, is, is exactly what, you, what, what it sounds like. It's two things intentionally being put together, right? So synchronization licensing um, developed out of people who are creating one work, like a movie or a TV show, a YouTube video, a slideshow, some, so, some like independent type of work of media. And then including that... Um, that media with some something else, and in this case, with sync licensing, it's your song, right? So when they merge what they're creating, video, image, app, you know, like whatever it might be, with your song, they're creating a new work, and they're synchronizing those two things together. And so, f- from the simplest, um, in, the, in its simplest form, a sync license is in what is when music is being used with something else, and they need your permission to use it because they created the video, but they didn't create your music. So they're asking you for a synchronization license in order to make sure that you're okay with um, them using your song. And, and so that's the same basic concept from big advertisements all the way down to you know the thousands of YouTube videos that we put soundtracks into every day. And, and it's just a way for those two creators to kind of cooperate together. As the, the music creator... What 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 are the rights that I need to own in order to, or that are being asked for when a license? Is- that is an excellent question. So uh, you have to write and own both. You have to write the song and own that publishing, or somehow, like if you're a label, you need to have the permission from the writers who you worked with, and or um, some some sort of agreement in place that says. I have the rights to this publishing for synchronization licensing. And it needs to be specifically for synchronization licensing. So if you're a label and you agreed to put a band's album out and you just decided, you know, that's what you want to do, sell downloads, you know, work with CD Baby, sell downloads and CDs, uh, you should really look at your agreement twice because you may not have set up a deal where you had the right to license their compositions for sync licensing as well. Like you actually, it's actually a very separate thing from selling downloads and selling CDs. So the composition is is half, and the other half is the sound recording. So if uh, you wrote all the songs and your buddy in your band paid for the studio sessions and you guys have an agreement that he owns the masters and you own the publishing, then you both would have to agree that this like sync licensing is something that you would want to do if someone were to buy a sync license from you. Lots of times like it, when you when you take it up to the um, the the more like uh, recognizable artists or the more, you know, um, popular artists who have lots of different publishers or lots of different writers on their albums or it, there's a compilation CD where there's one recording zone by one label and another recording zone by a different label many times you have many different parties all having to issue a separate synchronization license for one use of one song in like one movie mm-hmm. so in, in most CD Baby artists though um, I imagine um, you own the recording because you record it yourself and you own the publishing because you wrote the to- you wrote the song, or you and your friend wrote the song, and you guys have an agreement, and you're good to go if you if you control both of those things. Yeah, and I would agree with you that most cases for CD Baby artists, they will be both the publisher and the master rights owner, even though they've probably never thought of themselves in that way before. Right, you know, it's like general. If you created all of it, and you know, from from you know strumming the guitar and writing the the lyrics all the way to you know, um, exporting your Pro Tool session, you know, you are, you're, you're good to go. And what, what you described, um, I guess for the, for the purpose of this conversation moving forward, let's, let's call that traditional sync licensing. Does that work for you? That I've heard great. you refer like to that. it as that before, as opposed to what we're going to talk about a little bit later. But in like a traditional sync licensing deal, um, it's a pretty complicated process and, uh, 
maybe tell us a little bit of how it works, but the, why it's such a big opportunity for independent music nowadays. Right. Maybe mm-hmm. didn't exist, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, well, you know, when we were getting started 10, 15 years ago with Rumblefish, it was really, the the big question was, are you a sellout if your song's in a movie or a TV commercial? And, you know, what what does that mean? And, And there was a lot of debate about, you know, what type of endorsement you're giving as an artist if you put your song into a movie, TV show, or, you know, video the early video games. And I think a lot of that has kind of dissipated, artists are because there's so much more media and 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 part of the reason it's dissipated is because it's so uh ubiquitous there are so many tv channels now and there's so many video game um publishers and and developers um people making apps people doing all all sorts of interesting things so we've had it classified into these two categories right like traditional sync licensing is uh, the media that you grew up on, essentially. It's it's an advertisement, it's a movie, it's a TV show, it's a video game. Like, all the basics, right? It, and it could it could also mean simple things. Like, when you say advertisement, that could also mean, like, a, a corporate video for a shoe company where they're just showing everything internally. And it's never going to go to customers or anything, but it's going to go to... Um, to their, their employee base and it's going to be used for a commercial purpose. So, but that's, that's what traditional licensing is and, and the ecosystem that's grown up around it has a couple key players that uh, would be good for CD Baby artists to know kind of like who they are. So there's ad agencies obviously that are making the uh, commercials and, and some of the internal media. Uh, there's brands that you go directly to the brand where they're not using an agency and there's like an internal marketing type of person. And then when you get to the the movies and and other projects, um, like more independent type of film projects and media projects, there's music supervisors, and their job is to search through and find music and then acquire the synchronization licenses for those. And then it gets down to, you know, the smaller the project, the more, you know, just like, you know, the smaller the band or the smaller the, the, the music project, you kind of do everything. You master it, you record it, you tune the guitars. Same thing for the smaller media projects. The guy you talk to or the gal you talk to is the producer, the director, the music supervisor, the distributor, they're everything. So there's that ecosystem has been set up and, and they use providers like Rumblefish to find the music and look at usually a creative brief that says, here's the type of thing we're making, here's what the, the episode's about, or here's what the, you know, the TV commercial's about. We go through our catalog, and our representatives um, pick out the songs and pitch them. And then if the music works, then you negotiate a rate for that use. And the rates on the low end for traditional could be you know in the low hundreds of dollars uh, US, and go all the way up with advertisements to you know, over 100 grand. Mm-hmm. And, and the more expensive a license gets, the more rare it is, it's a, it's a gener- as a general rule. Yeah. For some general understanding, how big is that ecosystem that you're talking about? Just um, how many people, like music supervisors, film productions, I mean, how many, how many opportunities are out there in that world compared to what we're going to no, talk a good question. about there, things later? So we found, by counting up all the license requests that we could um, muster up you know, some intelligence on, we believe that there's uh, well over 250,000 licensing opportunities for traditional sync licensing uh, on an annual basis. And that, that could go as high as you know, half a million. just depends on how you count the licensing opportunities, right? So if we get a license request and it says, we want to use 10 songs in this, you know, um, in this movie, we would we would count that as one licensing opportunity because you know we had to count them somehow, but the hundreds of thousands is essentially the answer. Like in the low hundreds of thousands, we usually use two hundred fifty thousand as an example, and there's about ten thousand professionals out there uh, worldwide who are out shopping for sync uh, licenses to to put songs in their projects, and so that's a lot of. I mean, you can imagine. Um, there's no way you could watch every TV show. There's no way you can play every t- every video game. There's no way you're going to watch every ad or every corporate video, you know, unless you're really trying to punish yourself. How would you ever want to do that? But <laughs> there's there's a lot of media out there, and they and most of it uses music, so they have to get it from somebody, and we try and make it as easy as possible for them to find uh, all the independent artists that we represent. Yeah. 
So a lot of what you're talking about with traditional sync would, from, you know, the the average consumer, how they interact with it, that would be just watching a, a TV show, like Grey's Anatomy is one that's, you know, always notorious for having the big acoustic indie pop song at right. the end, or yeah. some, a show like that, or, or Old Navy commercial. Those are the kind of the big traditional sync opportunities, that, you know, feature films. And then, you know, there's some smaller ones as well, but that's probably what most people would be familiar with and, and yeah. understand. Yeah, you know, like um, from art films to, you know, the big blockbusters, uh, we can put a song and think sync happens all the time when you're not really expecting it or you really don't think about it. Like the car radio, when someone gets an actor in a movie gets in the car, they turn on the radio and they drive two blocks. Or there's a club, you know, um, you know, the wrestler. Yes, um, yeah. the, the film The Wrestler we had a bunch of music in there for our artists and they were stoked to be a part of, of that project because it, it got so much recognition and, and one of our artists missed their track <laughs> because it, it was you know it, 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 was, it was like a really quick usage mm-hmm. right? and it's not something that, that's always featured you know yeah. so when you're thinking about sync you, know, you may be excited you're in a, you get in a big project but you know sometimes you're the, the background noise at the bar or you know, there's music everywhere so. yeah yeah yeah, and that's a good point that you raise um, because everything you're hearing, like when you're watching TV or, or film, you you know, you're the whole thing's an illusion. You're seeing the scene that's obviously not real. It's actors and sets, and you hear the jukebox playing in the background. It's really not playing in the background. Yeah, everyone's so, dancing in silence yeah. <laughs> on set, you know. And all that music is licensed and requires a sync license, and I don't want to get off on too much about pricing, but the the way the music gets used is plays a part in how much the artist ultimately gets paid right yeah so if you are the theme song for a tv show you're gonna make a lot of money right Mm -hmm. if you are the you know the the car radio or the nightclub or you know some more much more incidental use then you know it's it's hundreds of dollars or you know low thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. just depends on the show right because how popular the show makes a big difference so i think it's important for artists to have the the expectation that your music will always be priced proportionate to the the use and the size of the project. Like so, for example, if someone makes an independent film about um, you know cars, and it's a short animated film, and it's a, like really terribly drawn, and and they put like two thousand dollars into the whole budget, you're not going to get a lot of money to be the theme song for Cars, <laughs> the animated you know with pencils and crayons, right? Uh, and, and shot on an iPhone, you know, you're not going to get a lot of money for that. But if but if, if you're the title for that, but if you're the theme song for Cars by Pixar, same exact use, much bigger company, much bigger budget, Could then be the same song, same song, right? Yeah. Same song, same use, different project, a lot a lot of difference in the fee, so. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned The Wrestler. I had a friend that, uh, a band here in town, they got a placement, I think it was the Ghost Whisper or something, and he was like, you know, tweeting about it. And so I turned it on, and I literally had the stereo cranked, and you could kind of hear some drums <laughs> and stuff, but it was like not one point in the You the couldn't show. hear it. There yeah. was nothing recognizable <laughs> to be them, and he has a very characteristic voice. I'm like, well, I'm glad you got paid, but you know, right, so right. sometimes it could be this amazing placement. It, it, it's funny because sometimes it's, the placement and the fee could be the same, but just the, the how the volume of the yeah, it, 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 they're some gonna shows have loud music. Some shows have really quiet music, and it's just weird. Right? There's there's been times where we've gotten letters from our artists where they're just stoked because there was a use and it was featured. It was the music was really forward and in, in on picture, whether it was an ad or you know a movie or whatever video game, um, and it was really prominent. And there's other ones where the artist can't even find it. You know, it's yeah. like we did a soundtrack for a video game that had over 250 songs in it. It was the biggest video game soundtrack ever released at that point. And then a lot of our artists couldn't even, they went and bought the game just to find their song. They couldn't even find their song. There was, <laughs> the game was so big and had so many levels and yeah. things going on. They just were happy to be in it and they got their check. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. But, uh, so it's all yeah. over the place. But that, that's, the, the, that's kind of the traditional yeah. world is, you know, movies, TV shows, video games. Um, and 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 we separated out the different a different section, uh, which we call microsync licensing, mm-hmm. for the more high volume type of media that's happening that's created not by the ten thousand professionals out there that are you know that know a lot about sync licensing, but the hundreds of millions of people who are creating content, mo- mostly video content, 
um, online and in mobile apps and such. And that that's what Microsync is all about. That's, yeah, and this, that's the other segment. And this is what I'm actually the most excited about with our, our new partnership. And I think it's one of the cool things that Rumblefish has kind of been taking the charge on is that the the what we've been calling traditional sync um, field has gotten pretty crowded. There's still yeah, lots there's a lot of, of great opportunity. It. There's more, you know, that that field is growing, but there's it's it's gotten crowded. The secrets out. The secrets out. Exactly. You yeah. know, because like you know, artists, some of the 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 artists that have had amazing success on CD Baby, most of them had some sort of traditional sync placement that launched their career. Right. Um, and, you know, with Ingrid Michaelson being in Grey's Anatomy and old Navy commercials, and there's lots of CD Baby artists that have had opportunities like that. And kind of, it's fueled record sales as a result. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but what I, with the micro sync, what I think is cool is that it, it, it takes it to the consumer in a way where that artists... I think it seems a little bit more tangible for the artist to actually make a difference and and cause revenue streams for their music. But why don't you explain a little bit about, you know, uh, I know you have some numbers about videos being made and kind of the consumer side of uh, media creation where the traditional sync is just concerned with the commercial side. Yeah, so it's the difference between... um you know, how, how, regardless of all the, like we were talking about TV shows, right? You couldn't possibly watch every TV show where you certainly are not going to watch every YouTube video. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and where it may actually be physically possible to watch every TV show in your, in your lifetime, it's certainly not like with these media channels, right? So, so YouTube and Vimeo and Facebook and all these different platforms are all incorporating um, video. And, and then there's all these really, really cool new apps and, and platforms. Um, Animoto is another good example where it's something it, you grab all your images, you put them together, and you make a quick video. Um, or Highlight Cam, which is, which is a mobile app that does, this, does a similar type of thing. Um, and, and all of these tools uh, are, are, are growing in numbers significantly. So if you, if you wrap it up to how much content is being created... What we found is that there's well over 50 hours of video being uploaded every minute um, by by several hundred million users, and and that's a lot of video. I mean, if you think this every every minute, a lot of kittens and puppies and babies. <laughs> I know. Yeah. How many terrible cat videos have been made during the time it took us to record this interview? That's right. <laughs> 4,000 cat videos. Uh, and all of them have more views than any of my music. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, right. And they're so cute. Um, but, but yeah, the, that's a lot of video content. And that does not include mobile, right? And if you think about how many devices are out there, there's a couple million desktop um, computers out there. Uh, sorry, a couple billion desktop computers out there. And uh, I haven't looked in the past, you know, a month or so, but it's it's, it's approaching, I believe, five billion um, mobile devices. Right? Not all smartphones, of course, yet. But it just gives you an idea. There's going to be a lot more mobile devices out there than there are desktops, and a lot of the growth is coming from phones and tablets and stuff, where people are creating stuff, or they create it on their phone. They they mess around with it on their tablet and they upload it. But all roads lead to sharing, right? So there's you know, hundreds of millions of people creating the content. There's, you know, tens of hours being uploaded every minute. And the last we look for images, there's about 360 billion images that were uploaded uh, last year in 2011. So that's a lot of content. And when people share it, people share a video or people share like a slideshow, it's always better with music, right? I mean, you can't separate... If you really don't like somebody, send them a slideshow with no music because it's really hard to sit through. You know, you're just like, oh god, you know, this. Your kid's baseball game was probably good when you were there, but I just don't get it. You know, Um, but yeah, so so that music makes it better, just like it makes movies better, just like it makes the TV commercials better. So we've created an infrastructure for people to be able to find on our licensing properties, um, friendlymusic.com is what we created as uh, our microsync kind of outlet. And, and, and this year we'll also have uh, ways to access that through mobile. So you can really easy grab, easily grab a soundtrack for your YouTube video 
and a soundtrack for your Animoto video, soundtrack for, you know, you name it, wherever you're creating it in an app or a website and be able to compensate an artist when you grab it. And, and that happens in a couple of different ways. And, and YouTube, which I'm sure you want to talk about, uh, is, is, you know, the 800 pound gorilla there. But, um, the two ways that you get compensated when someone uses your songs, I'm sure people are wondering like how all that works. Cause mm-hmm. it can be yeah. kind of uh, confusing cause there's a lot of moving parts. One way is we sell you, a, we sell you a sync license, just like you would buy it as a professional, putting it in a, in a, in a big movie. You buy a sync license from us for a buck 99 and, uh, and, and we're experimenting with other pricing, but essentially where we've really landed is about $1.99 per song per video. As, and this would be like, you know, just random person who's making a video, not the artist. Who's, just, right, just right. No, clarify. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're like, going to charge you to use your own music. Just, just so, just please so hate us. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, of course. Yeah. When you use your own stuff, um, Obviously, that's it. It doesn't cost you anything. But what we want to make sure is that it that other people who are making videos have an opportunity to compensate you for your music when they're putting it as using it as a soundtrack. So what's cool is like that group of ten thousand people that were professionals has grown into hundreds of millions of people who are amateurs or semi pros out. Um, on YouTube and on the social networks, in, in the apps, creating content, and they want soundtracks. So we'll, we're going to sell them those soundtracks for a buck ninety nine each, and that's for like non commercial type of use. And if if it's a small business or if it's a you know uh, like a local sandwich shop or whatever, then the licenses start to go up. Right, it's like twenty five dollars or one hundred twenty five dollars, a couple hundred dollars, but it's still high volume. Like a wedding photographer, like we have a lot of wedding photographers who hit us up and say. You know, I make ten videos a month, and you know, it's and and I need some really cool love songs for for these videos, and I want to post them online. So obviously, we don't consider them to be they're a professional, right? But it's like a small business type of thing, and they're making a lot of videos. They're not making like one movie a year, or mm-hmm. you know, they're not making a big TV ad, and it's not J Lo's wedding. It's just you know, Susie and Bill, right? So. So, so that's, that's the one way is a la carte. We sell licenses for um, like a flat fee per song, per video. And then the other way, uh, which is really common and, and really popular, is uh, with revenue share. So sometimes the music is, is free to the user, but it's not free to use. Like on YouTube, if you are a CD Baby artist and you want to promote your, your microsync revenue, you can create your own videos and or maybe have like a contest with your fans and say, here's a particular track that I want you guys to use to make videos with and share it with your friends. The video with the most views wins something, you know, like they get to meet the band, they get to hang with us. I write a a funny song about you, whatever you want to do. Um, Because the way that works is the more views that any video that includes your soundtrack gets, the more li- likely it is to earn ad revenue. And when it earns, when videos earn ad revenue and they have your song included with it, then we collect some of that ad revenue on your behalf as a royalty. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's how the YouTube system works. So the name of the game is get your song into as many videos as possible. And whether someone bought it on Friendly Music or whether it's you, who obviously you're not going to buy it on Friendly Music, you're just going to make your own video load them up, um, uh, upload them to YouTube, um, or load them up <laughs> into something else. Is that what the kids are saying these days? <laughs> yeah. All the kids are loading up YouTube. Uh, and then, uh, and when it goes online, uh, make sure as many people see it as possible. We have artists that create videos with their own music on it, um, on them, uh, every week just to try and get a video that catches or get more views and they promote those videos kind of like they promote their own songs because they can really influence their own revenue. It's a a really cool way that, um, that you can actually kind of drive some revenue and that's uh, as an artist. Yeah. You can actually affect it yourself, which is like, we briefly, we should mention what friendly music is because I don't think we've actually said what friendly music.com is. And you mentioned it a couple of times. (laughs) Uh, it's a group of hippies that yeah. sell songs <laughs> on corners in Oregon, yeah, in Portland. <laughs> they hug trees and sell yeah. uh, vinyl records. No, Friendly Music is our consumer brand. So Rumblefish has been our brand uh, ever since, um, 
you know, we started the company essentially. And that's the brand that those 10,000 uh, licensing professionals out there have come to know over the past decade, you know, for the, the sync licenses for movies, TV shows, and video games. So when we started to get really heavy into user-generated content and licensing music to consumers, we wanted to make it really um, obvious to a consumer that that they're buying a soundtrack and not confuse them with, you know, a $100,000 license for a TV commercial. Mm-hmm. So we didn't want them to show up to to our, our, our site, and we license music to um, professionals at musiclicensingstore.com. We didn't want to send them there. So we thought it would make sense to build a new brand, which has done really well, and we launched that brand in partnership with YouTube. Uh, it was a huge launch um, in, in 2010, and that went really well, and people really got it and started buying soundtracks for their YouTube videos. And, and now, if you add up all the different services um, for consumers, like what volume we're doing, and it's all under the Friendly Music brand, mm-hmm. um, we're doing you know, thousands and thousands of soundtracks a day. And yeah. it's really cool. It's cool to see the thing take hold, and there's no shortage of new videos, uh, new video services or new video apps or new video anything Um, and there's a a lot more people are using their mobile devices to to create content too so we're trying to get to them everywhere they can make a video and um i i I think at this point i'm sure some artists are kind of thinking big deal the the consumers don't care about licensing music they don't understand um it's hard for artists to understand but i think they actually are maybe going to understand whether they understand fully or not i know that many people it's been an issue for them especially increasing over the last year with their videos getting slammed with infringement notices on youtube i hear hear more and more people saying they're like and they freak out and they're like i don't you know i just added a cold play song to my video because i thought it looked cool i wasn't trying to infringe anybody's rights and i think this licensing issue is going to be more in the forefront of what consumers are facing they're going to understand that Yes, I'm going to upload videos. Here's a easy way for me to get music that I know isn't going to get pulled from YouTube and everything's cool. It's simple, easy, and um, everything's good. Well, it's, it's not a new issue, right? Like we dealt with this in the music business with downloads, right? Mm-hmm. Where everyone said, everyone was all doomsday about it with Napster. They said, how could you possibly ever compete with free? Mm-hmm. It's never going to happen, you know? <laughs> the music energy is doomed, you know? Yeah. And, and music's going to be free forever, and mm-hmm. artists are going to be, like, you know, crawling down the streets because they're starving, you know? There's no way. Artists, it, artists have always been starving. I don't yeah. know why people use that argument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we managed to, <laughs> we've all managed to be hungry no matter what, right? Uh, yeah. Where did that $10,000 royalty check go? Mm-hmm. Anyways. Uh, so it's the same situation all over again, but now it's uh, for soundtracks, right? So soundtracks are a piece there's just a part of how video works you, you can't separate music from video you can't separate music from slideshows mm-hmm. i mean you, you know obviously you can but it's just not nearly the experience it is with it right so the big networks uh social networks and the big uh you know popular apps and games they all really have to come up with a way to deal with it and 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 to allow their users to um to to easily use music right so it's kind of turned into two camps so so the question is how do you compete with free with soundtracks so how do you compete with free free for soundtracks um number one is people make videos for specific reasons they have specific occasions and themes that they pretty commonly go to and we've licensed over five million soundtracks now into online videos and we've seen uh, a lot of videos, mm-hmm. right? And and we see what the common themes usually are. So we have a um, an editorial calendar that we work to where coming up, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. Ho- uh, the holidays just came up. Um, Halloween was before that. We make sure to make that music readily available. So, for example, um, al- although I know you're 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 t- a total. Uh, romancer. Uh, <laughs> you're, How did you guess? Yeah, you're, you're a playboy. No, uh, although I know that you probably have an extensive collection of love songs, you probably don't own or have that song 
that is so sappy that you would want to, you know, profess your love to your to your your man and your woman, right? Like in your phone or on your computer. Especially now that Spotify and Mog, I prefer Mog by the way. Mog's amazing. Okay. It's amazing. You should you should use it. Uh, especially since those services are like really streaming a lot of music. Pandora, of course, Pandora is awesome. Um, you don't necessarily have that right on hand. And, and, and so you want like the, the really emotive love song that you're going to make your video and profess your love to your, to your girl. Uh, it's going to be easier to find it on Friendly Music because it's Valentine's. It's two weeks from Valentine's Day. Uh, you probably don't plan that far in ahead, right? So it's two days before <laughs> Valentine's <laughs> Day right. or the morning of Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, there you go. That's and you, about more. Right. <laughs> and, you, and you go to Friendly Music and here's like not one song, but like 10 different playlists of love songs. And so the convenience of it, right? That, I mean, that's how you compete with free. You come up with relevant ways to, for people to express themselves, you know? And like on Halloween, I don't have a Halloween playlist on my phone. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a Halloween playlist. I've never favorited one on, on Mog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if I've ever heard a Halloween playlist. Yeah. But I may want to do the, you know, the Monster Mash you know, video crazy you know thing from the party that we had and everyone's dressed like lunatics and yeah. I want to send something out and share it on Facebook or whatever so we make that music really easy to find the, all of our search tools so people are, are happy to pay for it just for the convenience of it and, and, and we do have believe it or not you know we do have a lot of people who know they could steal the music somewhere else or rip it or go download it but they would rather pay the license fee because they really love the artist mm-hmm. you know they want to send some money the artist's way um, but there's there's that, and that's kind of the more um, the kind of like positive side. The, neg- the 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 that's the carrot, you know. The stick is a lot of these networks are using content identification software now. So, like you said, you know, hey, I put this cool Coldplay song on my video, and I wasn't trying to like steal from Coldplay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just wanted to make a cool video, right? Um, so, the more that content ID becomes prevalent the more useful licensed a licensed option will be. Yeah. And and so that's that's why we're we're incorporating friendly music into all these other services so that right there where you make the video you can grab a song. Yeah. So yeah. when you like when you're using YouTube, if you go into their audio swap tool, um, you know, you can pick our music there to put it in your video once your video's been blocked. You know, so, it's, so if you get a notice from YouTube that says, Hey, my video's been blocked or your video's been blocked because you use Blank Artist, you can click on the audio swap tool, go in audio swap, grab a, a Rumblefish track, and you're good to go. Yeah, a couple things there you brought up that uh, we want to talk a little bit about. The the content ID, because we had this question on uh, an article that we have on our blog about this whole deal, and someone was wondering, how does YouTube know if someone uploaded my music? Do they have to get it from me, the artist? Do they have to get it from friendlymusic.com? Where do they, I mean, how does YouTube know? And why don't you just kind of explain what uh, content ID is? Because sure. for a lot of people, that's probably a new concept. And I would say when we were talking about, you know, uh, you mentioned Napster, that I think with content ID, the whole industry is more prepared to handling and monetizing video than they were with monetizing digital music. Right. And I think that's kind of a, a big uh, difference with what's happening now and kind of explain how they do that. Right. So uh, so what is content ID, right? And then like, what is it and how does it work? Mm-hmm. You know, kind of two different things. So content ID is exactly what it says it is. It's a way to identify content. And in the case in the world we live in, that's music content, even though content ID is also used to identify other yeah. things like video content and stuff. So that's, that's why your, you know, uh, Disney movie you uploaded to YouTube didn't <laughs> work. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Work. Yeah. Um, so uh, what happens with content ID is think of content ID as a big ear <laughs> and those 50 hours of video uploaded every minute have to they have to go by the ear. They have to get listened to. And they get listened to by, obviously, like an algorithm. And what it does is it just compares, right? Um, it's, it's like you know, a little kid's game where you flip over the different images and try and match two. Yeah. That's all it's doing. It's saying, let me see what this is. Let me listen to this and see what it is. And let me go back into my files and see if, if I've already heard that before. Mm-hmm. And if, if, there's, if there's no match, then it's not flagged. Right? And if there is a match, oh, yes, I've heard this before. It's in my big database. Um, the big content ID ear right, says, uh, I'm going um, to send a notice based on whatever rules, whatever the, the, the person that heard that 
Uh, there's someone that owns that song that I've heard before. And they've asked me to either block this video, they've asked me to uh, uh, monetize it, or they've asked me just to let it go through and kind of listen, you know, and, and watch kind of the views and stuff. So, so on our side, uh, the way that works for us is um, we are the ones providing those rules, those business rules to the content ID system. And we say, hey, you can block, block watch, or monetize, essentially. And we monetize everything because that's our job. Our, our job is to represent our artists and monetize their music. If they would like to employ someone to block their music, they can. It's just not us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think that makes a lot of sense for us. But So we're the ones that um, take the music. Like you said, you had someone online asking, how does it get there? What, how does this all work? The same way that CD Baby distributes your music to iTunes... Rumblefish, when you sign up for sync distribution, we distribute your music um, into Content ID, right? And 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 that type of distribution is different in that it's not available for sale on YouTube. It's available for sale on FriendlyMusic.com to consumers. But when it shows up in someone's video, YouTube will be able to quickly identify it, and then we can start to earn revenue for you on that video that includes your music. Yeah. So. It doesn't matter if if somebody, um, if it's one of your fans that uploads it, it doesn't matter if it's you yourself, it doesn't matter if it's someone who got it from a pirated music website, if it gets on a video and uploaded to YouTube, they ID it, you can make money from it. Yep, it can come from anyone. and Anyone who's ever bought your record or not or whatever that has a copy of it, put it in a video, uploaded it, we're collecting revenue for you. And 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 of and of course, like just to be clear, just because someone puts your song in a video and uploads it doesn't mean you're instantly making tons of cash. No, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it just means that um, you have a much higher probability of of earning revenue because we can't control um, YouTube's ad inventory, right? So mm-hmm. they can't put an ad on a video if they don't have enough ads that day, you mm-hmm. know? So, and they're not going to put an ad on the video that has two views. Yeah. So it's uh, completely up to you to what videos they put ads on and when they do that. And we just want to make sure that if the music's out there and people are using it and no one's earning any revenue, no harm, no foul, right? Mm-hmm. Um, unless you choose as an artist, not through us, but through someone else that you want to block that. That's up to yeah. you, you yeah. know? It's your music. But if you want to monetize it, then if someone's earning money, then you need to get your, your fair share of that. Mm-hmm. And so if there's an ad, uh, then we'll make sure you get your percentage of that. But if there's no ad, don't be upset. <laughs> because, you know, it, unless you're selling the ads, you know, and yeah. it's on your own blog site or whatever, or whatever um, we just want to make sure that you collect for whatever's actually... Um, so if someone else is earning money, you deserve your cut. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess probably the the easiest way to, for for someone to kind of picture how Content ID works is if you've used an app like Shazam or SoundHound. Those totally those apps when you're you know I've done this many times. I'm like in the car and I turn on and of course the DJs never tell you what the song is. I'm like right. fumbling with my phone while I'm driving down the road trying to get you know Shazam or SoundHound open to yeah. ID the song and it tells me what it is or. I've been in at the mall and it's like, oh, this is a really cool song. Who is this? Or I'm like, I know who this is. I can't remember who is it. And then, or, or TV show, same thing, anywhere. Whatever. Yeah, you pull that out and uh, it's checking that ID and it's saying that song is this. You know? And, yeah, that's exactly what it does. It's yeah. totally continuity. And and there's a safe mode, by the way. Uh, a, a, like there's a, a driving a driving setting. Yeah, really? for Shazam. So you, so you can continue to do these wonderful interviews with all sorts of interesting people. <laughs> Uh, don't kill yourself with Shazam app. It has like there, and, there was and all a sketchy is, moment once where I'm like, dang it, it's gone, yeah. it's gone. I'm trying to reverse. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just like a big like, but yeah. it's like one big button, you uh, know. Huh. So be safe out there. Turn that on. <laughs> yeah. And Content ID isn't just on YouTube. It's no. it's all over. The, there's lots of lots of other sites that are turning on Content ID controls. And so uh, when you provide your music to us, any con- any site that that has an agreement with Rumblefish, and we're when we're growing very quickly, uh, we'll make sure that your music is in each of those Content ID systems, yeah. so yeah. that we can collect revenue for you um, in all the other places. Because YouTube, obviously, everybody knows it's the biggest video site. Period. But it still only represents less than half of online video. Yeah. So there's a lot of other um, online video properties out there that we want to make sure and collect 
revenue for you, uh, for, for our artists, is anywhere we can. Yeah, and, there, and there's always new opportunities popping up. There's always new social networks that are doing interesting things that are gaining traction that you think, oh, there's just Facebook. There's actually a lot of like things like Pinterest and all these other yeah. places popping up that are yeah. really getting a following. It may be only you know, a measly 10 million users. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, there's stuff like that, you know, like Instagram, where people are uploading content, where it might have been something where they were just using content on their computer and not showing it over the web. But now if it's all going into the cloud, everybody, I mean, there's so much opportunity there. It's so much faster, given all the new devices now, for, for a company to build a, a large and meaningful user base. Yeah. Well, uh, one one other thing I wanted you to mention, and then then I'll give my little personal testimonial about what what Rumblefish has done for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you had talked about with FriendlyMusic.com. I think this is one thing that um, people who artists who may have not have had any experience with sync or even trying to create videos themselves. You talked about you know trying to find a particular song because I know a lot of people when they their their mindset is generally set to retail because that's what we as artists typically yeah. know. Pe- how are people going to find me in iTunes? How are people going to find me other places? You know other stores. Um, but with this, it's different because with with iTunes, it's a, a retail experience. They're going there because they want to buy something, a specific artist, and they're usually searching by the specific artist. They may find you by like, hey, listeners also bought this. But with sync licensing, especially like, you know, like you mentioned, wedding videos, people are searching by totally different criteria. Yeah. And it's an opportunity for your music to really fit niche markets and um, and really find a place with that kind of licensing and, and getting used in certain situations. Yeah, it's, it's more about um, situations, characters and feelings, right? You would probably never describe your music like as hillbilly music, right? I mean, maybe you would. I don't know. You guys have a lot of artists. <laughs> we've got we've got a, a robust hillbilly section. I'm down with hillbilly, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's bluegrass or it's you know, it's 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 a certain type of sound. But when you're a director or you're someone just like throwing your video together, you type in a keyword like hillbilly, and everybody knows what that sounds like, and that's how people are searching, right? Like there's there's more. Um, there's more people searching by their feelings or emotions or situations or characters. And that, that's more the way that people search for soundtracks is the type of vibe that they're going for. And that's why we've built so many um, search tools that allow people to just simply select their mood or they select an occasion and they find a quick song. Yeah. Because you know? um, yeah. that- unless your song is called Halloween, yeah. you know, is it really going to come up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and that's... The important point with this is that people, I, I've, I've, we used to get calls all the time for from people down in Hollywood trying to license various things or knew we had a big catalog and trying to find something more obscure and, and they say we're looking for something spooky and it's like you can literally go through thousands and thousands of tracks. You're like, oh, I know this artist, all oh, their music spooky, and you're like, and go, no, it's really not. And then you finally find, oh, this one is, but we need it to say, do this, or it needs to be this tempo. And you're like, oh, right, crap. It's right, really, right. <laughs> it's a really a difficult challenge. And when you think about finding that perfect song, and that's where what you guys are doing is cool, helping people find that. So even if you're not the top seller at CD Baby or iTunes, that doesn't mean anything here. It doesn't at all. I mean, what I really love, what I've come to love about sync licensing just as an artist and a musician and you know producer is that it really levels the playing field. I can't tell you how many records I've either produced or played on, and it didn't work for some stupid reason. You know, like... The drummer slept with the lead singer's girlfriend and band over, right? <laughs> For and it's you know, yeah. or or um, the the somebody wasn't good looking enough mm-hmm. in someone's opinion, yeah. and and that's usually like some jackass label that thinks that's important, mm-hmm. and it it has to do with their looks, or it has to do with the the fact that you put out your record the same week as another band that sounds just like you Mm -hmm. and they caught fire and you're suddenly imitating them and you'd never heard of them before, right? Um, 
there's so many stupid reasons why amazing music never gets heard and those artists never get paid. And sync is like the ultimate uh, level playing field because you can be fat, ugly, like you, you can have like completely abandoned your music career altogether. <laughs> uh, you could have not tweeted ever mm-hmm. <laughs> and we'll find a placement for you because someone's looking for, you know, the perfect song for their wedding video, you know? And so we've, we've managed to send out millions of dollars in royalties to artists where in many cases they're not used to getting checks for digital distribution or they're not used to getting checks for other things. Um, unlike you, you get checks for everything for your music. Sure. Right. right exactly. <laughs> um, the, the obscure thing reminded me of, I did, um, at CD baby, get an artist placed in a in a commercial for TBS, it was you know how TBS always shows old movies. Yeah, um, I won't say who the the famous star was. They wanted uh, just because I don't want anyone listening to go harass the guy. But uh, they were looking for a song about this famous female star that was the lead in this movie. Uh-huh. And they on CD Baby they found this guy who had a song titled with her name. Oh yeah, and. Uh, it was obviously recorded in his bedroom. He had no sales at all on yeah. CD Baby. It was. I, it had been up there for, I think, like three years. Uh-huh. And he got um, a big check. They licensed it. I think we're we're definitely past three times. It might have made it to four for two thousand dollars each time. Nice. And it was so awesome to call him because he's like. Like literally blew his mind. It's like you made my dreams come true. <laughs> it was just, it was so awesome because it's. Yeah. You know, he didn't spend much recording it. I'm sure it, it was you know a kind of a quirky song, right? And uh, he never in a, a million years was he thinking today someone's gonna give me two grand for this song, you know? And he just uh, paid for his MPC. Yeah, right? they licensed it. Uh, um, three times might have been four times, you know. That's awesome, and, man. Uh, and so those are the kind of opportunities that are out there for sync. That it's it's not retail. It's not who's the coolest artist. It's what people are trying to to look for. It's just a, it's a it's an outlet for expression. You know, you're trying to tell the storytellers need tools. Music is such an amazing tool to take. Uh, it can make a terrible movie relevant. <laughs> it can yeah. make it, it just provides so much emotional context. You know, and and you put the right song next to something, and instead of being um, like a confused or not necessarily completely put together story, you all, all of a sudden create all this emotional context and people, you know, you'll get a tear or you'll get yeah. someone really angry or, you know, like whatever story you're telling, yeah, you know, yeah. the music's an incredible way for, to tell stories. And, um, it's, it's just really cool to see a lot of those stories come through from the artists once they get their check, you know, yeah, yeah. and we've managed to send money, um, to artists all over the world. I don't even know how many countries at this point, but, and you get a lot of really heartwarming messages back, you know, like we've had all sorts of interesting stories about people who have, um, you know, like one custody of their kids back because they get consistent royalty checks every quarter. Mm -hmm. People who are just happy that they're able to like get the extra dollars they wanted to buy that guitar pedal Mm -hmm. that they had been just saving up for or the, or the mixing board or whatever. And, um, we have a couple labels actually that regularly, since we, they've been with us for a little while, and we've built up um, working with them, selling a lot more sync licenses for them over the years. They wait to record their albums based on our payment schedule. Yeah, and they work really hard at promoting their own music um, inside of Friendly Music and inside of our other channels. They're up, always uploading videos, and we send them big enough checks every quarter for them to, you know, base their their recording schedule around it because they pay the studios with yeah. their sync fees. Yeah. You know, and obviously that's not everyone. There's plenty of people that never get a penny yeah. because luck of the draw you know like their music just didn't quite fit but um but it's more often than not you know uh you, we can find some place for something at some point yeah because <laughs> of all those videos you know that would be made being yeah. made on this through microsync well and uh this this will uh, this brings us to the testimonial moment oh, here we go <laughs> since you mentioned getting a, a check, i brought some tissue that, that's <laughs> no uh that was the the i had one of those fall out of my chair moments um with getting a check uh, from this program. And uh, it was an album that I did years ago. It's it's on CD Baby. That's the only place that I'm aware of on the internet where it's even linked to, much less you can find it. Right. And it's something that I don't promote, it's it's just there. But um, a couple years afterwards had added it to the, the Rumblefish catalog, a few of the songs. 
had gotten a couple of things in like, you know, sports action DVDs or whatever. But then when the YouTube thing started, all of a sudden there was, uh, I think what, what made me notice it was it was a couple random sales at CD Baby of this album. I'm like, what on earth? How did anyone <laughs> even find this? So I went in the account, found, you know, went in the web. That's cool. Yeah. So I, the YouTube uh, I linked, uses turn into downloads. Yeah. Right? I linked in over to, uh, it's like this, there was a bunch of link, people coming from this forum and it was literally a forum for uh, this website that was all about pressure washers. Nice. And, <laughs> and I'm like, what on earth is going I've on? I've totally and, been to that forum. And so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a sweet place to hang out. So I go to the Page top Turner. and I'm like, the, the post that they were all coming from was this guy had posted his video to YouTube, like demoing his pressure washer, used the audio swap function to grab a song and grab one of our songs yeah. and put it in his video. And all these people were asking about, what was the song? Where, where can I find the song? <laughs> yeah. And they had He's like, don't you want to buy my pressure washer? Yeah. They're yeah. like, no. <laughs> and so these people were linking over to CD Baby to, to buy the album. But, That's awesome. But, but slowly, you know, over time, the, the checks started getting bigger and bigger. And I think the biggest one I had where I was like just totally unexpected was like a $1,300 check. Yeah, cool. For, there was mostly just people on YouTube sharing. And it's not like I'm doing anything to promote it. So, you know, that isn't necessarily going to happen for, to everyone. And, you know, that was the biggest check I got. They fluctuate, you know, that's not the average or, and there really is no guaranteed average, but it's like the, the cool thing is like, it's kind of reorients how you look at your music. It's not the the latest release that I'm promoting. That's right. It's on the shelves at record stores. And like six months from now, it's dead and gone. And we're on to the next release that I'm excited about. It's, even if you don't like your back catalog, it's about getting all your whole catalog working for you because sync is not about being the coolest, being the latest and greatest, or having the hit song. It's totally different. Right. And but it works for every kind of music. I mean, it's really the the ultimate like leveling leveling field or a level playing field because there's lots of like period pieces, you mm-hmm. know, and there's lots of if you think your music's outdated, it's perfectly relevant for a lot of cool projects. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, old timey music, eighties music, retro. I mean, anything yeah. you can imagine. There's there's potential opportunities for it. So that's why I think this is a cool thing, a cool partnership. That's like it's a way that artists can realize it's not you know I've because we have lots of artists that have like ten, twenty albums, and a lot of times they get frustrated thinking you know I haven't had one really take me to the next level, and it's like well you've got that big catalog yeah put it to work yeah right? put it to work for you i mean it's you know that album that i have with rumble fish i'm not doing a darn thing for it and it's actually working for me now <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're showing that record who's yeah, boss. yeah that's right i'll show you <laughs> who's gonna win this battle so <laughs> so anyway, so i think it's cool so that's why i'm really excited about our partnership and and just artists in general kind of reorienting how they think about how their music can generate revenue streams for them in the future. There's, you know, there are big sync opportunities that you guys are going to provide through, uh, for some artists through the traditional sync, but how this opens the doors for so much of that smaller revenue that can really add up. And I'm that's, and that artists can have a little bit more, be a little bit more proactive with. And so that's what I'm excited about. And that's a wonderful testimonial. Wow. Yeah, I'm blushing. You see me blushing? <laughs> Are we gonna hug? Yeah, yeah. long awkward hug. No, no, but so that's 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 what I think is really cool about sync licensing and and what a lot of artists may not have realized about where things are going. I know we hear a lot of doom and gloom about the music industry. Yeah, and this kind of stuff makes me think. You know, it's it, we're in a transition, and um, as long as artists own their catalog. I think that's the biggest thing that I think... It's a big prerequisite, yeah, you know? You gotta own your stuff if you own your stuff outright, or if you have the uh, the willingness to go out to whoever may co-own it, yeah. and just set something up with them simple, on paper, where you control it, and you can opt in, then go for it. You know, you, you really have nothing to lose um, uh, unless, you know, you... Uh, like to discourage the people who may get upset <laughs> you know because there's the good stuff and the bad stuff uh, to discourage the people who may be it may have expectations of like being able to approve licenses when they come through like getting an email saying oh yeah well this, we've had that question as right well. you know like this feminine product uh wants to use your song you know would you like to license your track to that like uh, unfortunately the way that the system is set up 
um, we used to ask for permission from artists, uh, like a uh, way back, uh, almost ten years ago. And what happened was, artists are busy making music, and they didn't have time to hit us up and say, "Yeah, that's cool." No, it's not. And we lost a lot of opportunities, like yeah. well over half of the opportunities, where there's just money sitting on the table. They wanted your song; it's sitting there. We're like frothing at the mouth to get it yeah. done. And we couldn't for whatever reason. It wasn't because the artists didn't care. It's just because they're, you know, focused on other things. So we, 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 made, we, we built the system, and with the partnership with CD Babies, it's the same, where if you opt in, make sure that you're cool with your music being used pretty much anywhere and, and that you're going for the revenue. And, and most of our artists, um, you know, who were kind of tentative going into it, that didn't quite know, like they'd, they'd start with maybe one album or they'd kind of test it out. Um, but almost, most of them who, who signed up were, have been thrilled with it. We, we have very few people opt out yeah. ever um, because we end up sending checks to a lot of our, our writers and, and, and labels. So Yeah, and I mean, artists raise that sometimes, but you know, if you're a punk rock band, chances are the, the feminine hygiene product you mentioned is not going to license your music. Yeah, right? You're gonna, I mean, because I know you guys have really good relationships with a lot of people that make the sports action videos, snowboarding, yeah, yeah. skiing. They're, that's the kind of places you're going to end up. You're going to end up with up. products yeah. that match your music. It's, to- it's like it's the 1%. Like every once in a while, I mean, like literally in the past um, couple of years, we've probably only had like one or two complaints and we've processed over 5 million sync licenses. Yeah. So, it's not that bad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I gotta say it because we gotta like you know want to give everyone like the full yeah. view, you know, like what what's out there. But yeah. but we couldn't be more thrilled about the whole CD Baby yeah. deal because there's so many interesting artists I think out there that have amazing music, and we don't have a good way to um, to onboard like a large catalog like that on our own. So the the partnership with you guys is just awesome because someone can just with a click. You know, just opt in and and try it out. You know, and see see if they like it. See if we yeah. can get any results for them, or if they're more of of a of a hustler. If they got a good hustle, then you can opt in and you can affect the revenue yourself. You can start to promote your songs on friendly music. You can promote um, your songs on our our professional licensing site, musiclicensingstore dot com, mm-hmm. and you know get the word out. And and now when you when you're talking to anybody. Because um, you asked about, asked about promotion earlier, if you're talking to anybody that makes ads or anybody that makes independent films or even anyone that makes a lot of YouTube videos, now you have a place to send them, right? Yeah. Instead of trying to figure out how to negotiate a deal with your buddy who works at an ad agency, which is just, <laughs> which would probably <laughs> be awkward, yeah, destroy your friendship, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, instead of trying to figure that out, uh, if you're sign up for the service and once you've opted in and we've got you in the in uh, music licensing store and friendlymusic.com then send them there. You yeah. can send them links, you know? You can you can have a really easy way for them to just snag your song and pay for some sync fees. Yeah, yeah, don't screw things up by having your lawyer friend try, who has no idea about, who does divorce law try and negotiate. I have seriously had this happen before, and I'm like, oh, you should get $100,000 for this, and this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Let me tell right. you, that is not what... That's not the way it works, buddy. Right. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, so... So anyway, um, yeah, well, uh, we could talk for hours because I know there's some other deeper details, but I'm sure you're busy. Five million licenses, that's a lot of work. So, Um, (laughs) well, Paul, thanks for being on the podcast. And uh, if uh, maybe we'll have you back in a a year or so. Yeah, thank you. And uh, with some new opportunities that pop up with all the new apps and sorts of cool social network things popping up. Yeah, we got a full calendar this year for all the new stuff that we're rolling out. So uh, we're stoked to just get some CD Baby music in there and yeah. it should be interesting. Yeah, and if you're a CD Baby artist, just log into your account, opt in, that's all you got to do and 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 then just wait for the money to roll. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Awesome, all right. thanks. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again, to Paul for taking time out of his day to to go into detail on the subject of sync licensing and the idea of micro sync. I'm pretty excited about this opportunity and hope it will be a great extra revenue stream for the independent artists out there. Again, if you're a CD Baby artist and want want in on the sync deal, just log into your account and opt in and uh, you can opt out at any time. So it's pretty much a no brainer. If you have any questions or comments, 
about sync licensing or anything else, a past episode or just something you'd like to see covered on the podcast, you can email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com or you can call our listener line at 360-524-2209. That uh, number is also on the podcast website at cdbabypodcast.com. And just a, a reminder for you uh, longtime listeners, that is a new number from some of our past episodes So uh, be sure that if you want to call in that you are dialing the correct number. Well, that's it. We'll catch you next time on the podcast. Thanks. You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 